how do you keep it flying at the speed of a rifle bullet? Now to do that, they needed a very special power plant. There are four sections to Concorde's power plant. First are the air intakes, leading into a conventional jet engine. Then come the afterburners and finally the nozzles. All of these four elements had to work in perfect harmony if Concorde was going to be able to fly across the Atlantic at twice the speed of sound. In charge of designing the air intake systems was Professor Ted Talbot. How do you actually propel it up to speeds of, what, 1,350 miles an hour using a conventional jet engine? Well, you have to give the conventional jet engine the conditions that it likes, even though you're flying at that, at that high speed. Mm. So you have to slow the air down scientifically from where it comes in to where it gets to the engine itself. This is really a subsonic engine developed to last at supersonic conditions. And, and they, uh, most supersonic aircraft have subsonic engines in them. So what happens if air goes into an engine like this at supersonic speeds? Well, the engine will simply malfunction. So it seems to me that this air intake was actually crucial then to getting Concorde flying efficiently at supersonic speeds over long distances. If this had failed, then the rest of the aircraft would have failed as well. And it was because we were able to do this, and lots of other people weren't, that we managed to get the Concorde going across the Atlantic. What's also amazing about these intakes is that they had to work across a vast range of speeds, from standing still to twice the speed of sound. Now to see how this is done, I need to go on a virtual Concorde flight, but standing inside the intakes. These engines need the most air on takeoff. And so the ramps up here are raised and an extra inlet opens up down here, allowing even more air to rush in. The plane approaches something like 70% of the speed of sound. That's just over 500 miles an hour. There's now so much air coming in from the front of the engine that you don't need that flap anymore. That one can shut down. But as Concorde reaches the speed of sound, the drag really starts to build up. And the best way of pushing the plane through this barrier is to light up the afterburners down here. This produces masses of extra thrust all in one go. It's just like strapping rockets onto the wings. As the plane approaches the sound barrier, a really interesting phenomenon happens, which eventually creates the famous sonic boom. Any object being pushed through air creates a pattern of pressure waves that radiate out from it at the speed of sound. As Concorde gets nearer and nearer to the speed of sound, these waves start to bunch up until at the sound barrier they merge into one. The sonic boom is essentially this combined pressure wave hitting your ears. With Concorde now through the sound barrier, the afterburners are turned off as the drag starts to fall again. The problem now is that the engines just don't work properly. There's simply too much air being rammed into them. It's got to be slowed down. And this is where one of the really clever design elements of Concorde comes in. All to do with these ramps above me. Now, at about 1.3 times the speed of sound, they start to be gradually lowered, forcing the air into a series of shock waves that build up along the length of the top ramp and focus down here by the bottom lip of the intake. As the speed increases, the flaps are lowered more and more until the cruising speed of 1,350 miles an hour is reached. Each shock wave that the air passes through slows it down a bit. So by the time it reaches here, it's got down to just below 650 miles an hour. Now this is where the rear ramp comes in, expanding the air and in the process reducing its speed even further so that it goes into the engine at around 350 miles an hour. 
This is amazing. Between these two ramps, they've taken air in at 1,350 miles an hour and sent it out at 350. That's reducing it by 1,000 miles an hour in 11 feet. Concorde has now entered into the flight phase known as Super Cruise, where only 8% of the thrust is generated from the engines, 29% from the nozzles at the rear, and an amazing 63% from the intakes. This is where the Delta Wing and the power plant are working together at their best, allowing Concorde to fly efficiently at just over twice the speed of sound. Once Concorde reached supersonic speeds, it effectively became a rocket. But you still had to keep it flying straight and level. Now, with a conventional plane, you'd do that using flaps. But you couldn't use flaps with Concorde. They'd have caused too much drag. So what the engineers did was to design an ingenious system that used fuel. But most of the ones in this pack are... Alan Perry worked on the fuel systems for Concorde and also has lots of the original plans. Um, one of the things I'm very intrigued about is I have always thought that fuel was just there to propel a plane. Yes. <laughs> but you worked on the fuel system and it was used for something else, wasn't yes, it? Yes, indeed. If I, if I could just take these drawings away. Right. This is the plan view. Right. And on this plan, you'll notice uh, these shaded areas are labelled reservoirs. And they're all the fuel tanks that were installed in the Concorde wing and in the fuselage. Oh, okay. There was only a small amount of the wing that wasn't full of fuel. So the wing is, for all intents and purposes, one big fuel tank. It was discovered quite early on that with this type of wing, this sort of uh, delta wing, um, there was um, an aerodynamic feature that um, had to be catered for. So when the aeroplane takes off, in the first instance, the, the trim tanks at the front of the wing will be full of fuel. Right. Um, when the aeroplane gets into the supersonic regime, um, the effect is to take the average left on the wing, it moves back. It's just one of the things that happens, you know, with this type of wing. And um, the result of that is that the aeroplane becomes nose heavy because the lift is moved further back and the centre of gravity is where it was so the lift now um, is going to tip the aeroplane's nose down. The answer to that is to transfer the fuel in these forward parts of the wing here and under the floor into the back of the fuselage where this other tank is. By doing that the centre of gravity moves back balancing the new centre of lift. So it's a sort of balancing act then, is it? You're having to keep it tuned throughout the whole flight? Yes. For, for the most part, the flight engineer, who sits behind the pilot and co-pilot, is in charge of the fuel management system, and um, he has the last word. He is monitoring all the automatic systems that are being carried out. So he sits there in front of that panel with all those dials on it, doesn't he? Rather like an of... organist. <laughs> yes, it is a bit like that, isn't it? Yes. Sort of going, right, we'll have a bit from here yeah. to there to there to there. That's just right. to keep the whole yes. thing flying level. Yes. A lot to think about, though, isn't there? The engineer is a very busy man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The pilot just sits there and steers it. <laughs> <laughs> when Concorde slows to come into land, the centre of lift starts moving forward. And so the fuel is then pumped into the tanks at the front, still keeping the plane perfectly balanced. At the end of the flight, coming into land presented one final problem for the engineers to solve. And this is where elements of Concorde's design proved a problem. Because of the shape of its wing, it meant that it had to come in at what looked like a very, very ungainly angle, very steep, with the result that the pilots couldn't see the runway. Now, short of putting a glass floor in the bottom of the cockpit, there was only one way around that, and that was to hinge the nose down, which was what gave Concorde its very distinctive droop snoot. Somehow, 
It seems fitting that the last Concorde ever to land was here at Filton, where so much of the design work took place, and where Alpha Foxtrot now sits, never to fly again. You can't deny, though, that Concorde polarised public opinion. It used a lot of fuel, and it made a lot of noise, but to some people that noise was just part of its great appeal. So, here you have it. Concorde, one of the great engineering success stories and a true icon of the 20th century. What a plane.